But South America, you know, they're very religious down there. This is heavy. They're very, very, very Catholic. Now, in November rain, it's been like number one down there for a year or something, or more than a year. And it's kind of like their anthem. It, it, I forget, I think it was Columbia or something. It's kind of like, and they're very religious, right? And it just started raining when November rain started. And these people just freaked. They were, they're all doing like this and like, oh, wow, and, and praying. And it was really heavy. And it just. So in Slash's book, he talked about one of the most memorable moments he had during his time in Guns N' Roses. And he highlighted the concert that Guns N' Roses played in Bogota, Colombia in late November of 1992. Now, originally, Guns N' Roses were scheduled to play two shows. But there was a huge uh, issue with the fact that they played Venezuela previously and there was an attempted military coup. So some of their equipment got left behind in Venezuela and wasn't able to arrive on time. Plus there were some issues with the stage setup that happened that basically caused the stage to collapse like a day or two before the concert. So according to Slash's book, he said we were supposed to play two nights in Bogota, Colombia after that. But without the huge crate a cargo of equipment, it wasn't really an option. The promoter decided to roll both nights into one show and to take place the next night. So we had a day off to relax at our hotel. And the hotel was pretty huge. It was part of a, some kind of complex with a big movie theater downstairs. And I remember coming up the escalator and watching a Jurassic Park pinball machine emerge on the horizon as I got to the top. I'd just seen the movie and I had to play that thing. It combined two of my favorite interests, dinosaurs and pinball. When I got to my room, I arranged to have it brought up and spent the entire day playing the ball. Flash went on to say, during our stay, word got out to the authorities that we had drugs. So in another move typical of South America, the authorities got what he, he put in quotation marks, warrants to search our rooms in hopes of finding something that might require us to buy them off. I imagine at least the day of the show, the cops banged in, banged on the door of all of us and I had nothing. They came in guns drawn and found me freshly showered in a towel playing pinball. Oh, Hey, I said, hi, they showed me the warrant and started searching my room. I was pretty jovial that they tore through my stuff. Senor, is it okay to, if I keep playing? I asked. So the next, the show that night was on November 29th, 1992 was pretty magical. It was one of those moments that you can't believe is happening. Even as you watch it all unfold, even if you're a part of it. There was a torrential rainstorm the entire day before as our crew set up. The weight of the water buckled the stage roof, which wasn't ours, sending the lighting rig crashing to the ground. Luckily, no one was hurt, and the whole stage had to be redesigned. Then the day of the show, a sudden storm damaged some of our equipment. Despite more rain, people filled the arena and were lined up outside where fights broke out. A few cars were burned and the police had to use tear gas to calm everyone down. When we took the stage sometime around 11 p.m., the place went crazy. We were playing really well and the rain had held off throughout the entire first hour of our set until we played November Rain. As we started that song, literally on cue, the sky opened and it poured once again. It was one of those massive tropical downpours where one drop can fill a coffee cup. It was coming down in a black mist that mixed with the steam rising off the audience, and I could barely see through the clouds that formed in the arena. The people were a sea of silhouettes, and it was all very dramatic and very beautiful. It felt as if they and the band were one, and the audience was moved as we were, and they were into it, and it was truly passionate. It rained so hard that we finished the song, we had to break until the, rain, the storm passed, and once we did, we came back on and gave everything we had. We had every obstacle possible befall us between our show in Venezuela and the shows in Colombia, and considering the band's chemistry in the recent past, you would expect we'd have fallen apart under such duress. But that's the thing about guns. We'd self-destruct when everything was easy, but in these instances when every single factor seemed to be against us, everyone, Axel included, pulled together to make it happen. The extreme lows might have left me feeling like there was no tomorrow, but then we'd pull off this valiant rock and roll production in the face of adversity. I'd feel as if we were invincible. I think that we were a stronger band all around, and those moments renewed our collective faith and boosted morale like nothing else. And rather than be frustrated by what befell us in South America, we let the audiences at all of those gigs sustain us with their passion and drive to be our best. Our playing was elevated and it was intense as the fans were, and we were carried away along with them. We reached that point that musicians talk about where you're immersed in what you're doing to the degree that you don't even know what you are or who you are. You're part of the performance so fully that you aren't thinking anymore. And those moments are magical and the whole tour was like that night after night. And it was the band at its best and it was something that anybody who would have got, given their left arm to be a part of if it occurred consistently. But it wasn't ever that simple. When we weren't being tran uh, transcendent, we specialized in self-inflicted disaster. 
Now, Doug Goldstein told his version of the events of these gigs, and he said immediately following the uh, attempted coup in Venezuela that Hugo Chavez tried to orchestrate, he said that when they went to Colombia, he said, I also hired U.S. Embassy security to complement the eight or so security guys that I already had employed. The signs were not good, though. When the band's equipment was delayed leaving Venezuela, where they had just headlined a sold-out show to 20,000 people in Caracas, Guns N' Roses was booked to perform two shows, a Friday and a Saturday night in Bogota. And the group arrived at their hotel late on Thursday night, early Friday morning, where an already worried Goldstein was concerned to find three, the three promoters of the shows sitting in the hotel bar, absolutely out of their minds. Between the booze and the coke, I couldn't tell if they were going to fall down or jump over the effing bar. And then a noisy standoff ensued with the Colombian promoters demanding half of their money back, as the band would only now be performing one of their two scheduled shows. Goldstein, however, insisted that the band was happy to stay on and play a second show on the Sunday to make up for the lost date on Friday. He picks up the story by saying, they were like, no, F you, you have to give us the money back, I said. And he said, they said, no, F you, I'm going to bed tonight, good night. So I go to my room and about 4 o'clock in the morning, they call me. They informed Doug that they had taken one of the band's PR people hostage. Oh, and by the way, the three guys are all promoting the event. One guy owns a television station, one guy owns a radio station, and the other guy owns a newspaper. So the chances of getting my story out are effing nil. So I go, you know what? She's not that good. Click, hung up the phone. Haven't called her bluff, the so-called hostage was allowed to go back to her hotel room, and Goldstein then had to find a way to keep the band's calm to keep the band calm. So back in 92 in Bogota, it was crazy. The entire day and night, all you would hear is machine gun fire in the hills, and we're all going, why on the F are we all here? He was on the phone the morning of the show when suddenly there was a huge bang. A huge bomb outside the hotel rocked the rooms back and forth. So Duff, who looks like an effing ghost, he's been doing so much blow, he comes into my room and he goes, what the F was that? And I go, and Duff basically wants to leave he's freaked out by the bomb blast but doug pretends he didn't really hear it and basically duff threatens to go to the airport and leave before the show and basically doug said you can't do that to me and he goes are you out of your effing mind man i'm not effing staying here i go duff i'm going to take you back to the old compadre he's shaking his head as i'm talking i go one of the first questions i asked you guys when we met was what do you guys want to be and you guys collectively said you want to be the biggest band in the world and you know what to be the biggest band in the world you have to play the world and basically Duff laughed, and his rebuttal was one of the greatest comeback lines ever. And he said, no, no, Doug, I remember that dinner. Axel Slash, biggest band in the world. Duff, biggest band in North America, okay for me. So Goldstein wasn't laughing when they arrived at the venue that afternoon. The promoter, still convinced they would only be one show, oversold the event by about 30,000 tickets. So there are kids everywhere outside of the building that have tickets, but there's no seats for them, so the fire marshal and the cops aren't letting them in. The cops are on horseback, and they're wielding these huge wooden sticks, just pounding kids. The band, of course, they have no effing clue what's going on. So they're continuing to play, and it was a stadium with no roof. So like clockwork, Axel hits the beginning notes of November rain and a huge effing downpour. It was actually really cool. But they looted the streets of Bogota, the kids. All of the storefronts are being busted down and they're stealing all the shit and stuff from the shops, turning over cars. I mean, it was an effing scene. I used to say we were the signature CNN band. Every night there was something on CNN about GNR. Now, they weren't clear yet, though. At 7 o'clock the following morning, there was a fierce pounding on Goldstein's hotel door. I open the door, and it's some guy with a machine gun. He sticks a machine gun in my chest and hands me a letter. And I'm like, uh-oh. The letter was to inform Goldstein that he had a mandatory meeting with the mayor that day at 3 o'clock. So in Spanish, I tell the guy, as soon as Mr. Goldstein gets back, I'll let him know. He then went on to call, basically went on to the phone and called the U.S. Embassy security contact and asked him to come to his room where Goldstein showed him the letter. And he goes, there's no meeting. I go, right, I'm being kidnapped, aren't I? He goes, absolutely. Then he goes, time to get out of Dodge. So Goldstein moved fast to get the band out of the hotel by 7.30 a.m. and straight to the airport. We had to sneak out of town and we were never so happy to leave a place. What's cool is Vice did a cool interview with uh, one of the promoters from Columbia who worked with Guns N' Roses on the show, and he corroborated a lot of what Goldstein said, uh, especially the fact that the promoters were in the hole a huge amount of money because Guns only played one show instead of two, and they wanted their money back. And Goldstein offered to give them back $45,000, but that was basically it, and he was always surrounded by security. And the promoters decided, well, we'll just cut our losses and rock out to Guns N' Roses instead. And they corroborated that a lot of people were upset outside the show waiting to get in, which kind of indicated that, okay, they oversold the event. Now, one of the most startling revelations from that interview was that 
following November Rain, if you guys have seen the pro shot footage on YouTube, the band claimed they were going to come back on stage, but the promoter said Guns N' Roses were ready to leave the venue. And that's when they got into a confrontation with Guns N' Roses management, and the promoter headbutted Doug Goldstein, according to the Vice documentary, and they got into a scuffle. And basically, the promoter called his buddy at the airport and said, hey, Guns N' Roses are loaded with drugs. You guys need to search their plane and give them a cavity search. So that does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. I'll see you guys later.